range from viruses and antibodies to life beyond our universe in order to showcase the breadth of science and some of the pretty cool research that goes on in the School of Science at Birkbeck University of London. You might be wondering how this, these series of talks are different from other science podcasts and programmes. Of course, our primary aim is to make science relatable and enjoyable for a general audience. Viruses and antibodies to life beyond our universe in order to showcase the breadth of science. And... But we're not only interested in the science, we also want to explore how our Birkbeck scientists found their way to their current positions and also think about how creativity plays an important role in their research. And this is because we want to dispel the preconception that all scientists are the same kind of person with the same kinds of personalities, skill sets and interests. So for example, the media often portray scientists as people with a knack for numbers and a keenness for detail. But you might not have guessed that doing good science also requires a good level of creative thinking. And you might think that we all knew exactly what we wanted to be when we were younger, when we were growing up. But actually, many of us researchers didn't even know our jobs existed when we were students. So we're going to be asking our scientists about these things. And don't forget, you can join in the discussion too. So just type in your questions into the chat bar on the YouTube channel at any time, and I'll pick them up and ask them to our speakers. So thank you for joining us today for our final Science Saturday series of talks. But don't worry if you've missed previous weeks, you can find all 10 Science Saturday talks recorded to watch at your leisure on Bert Beck's YouTube channel. Remember, we're trying to make science accessible and enjoyable for everyone, regardless of age or previous experience. So please do have a look. So today's topic is becoming human. And today we're going to hear about both the evolution and development of how we have become a very special species of great apes with some uniquely sophisticated abilities. So let's meet our speakers. Gillian, Natasha, would you like to turn your shoes <laughs> on? Uh, so today we have Dr. Julie Forrester and Dr. Natasha Kirkham, and they're both lecturers in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Birkbeck. Julie lectures and researches evolutionary psychology, and she's going to be speaking first about the two sides of our brain. And Natasha researches and lectures developmental psychology, and she's going to be talking to us after Julie about how babies develop in the middle of everything. And again, don't forget, you can ask our scientists questions, type them into the chat bar during the talk, and I'll pick them up for the Q&A at the end of the talk. So, Gilly, are you ready to kick us off? I am. Thanks, Emma. Over to you, Gilly, and we'll speak to you at the end of the talk. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And Emma, maybe you can give me a heads up as to whether or not you can see everything okay. How's that? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. And again, thank you so much for joining us for our last installment of Science Saturdays. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about becoming human from an evolutionary perspective and about the two sides of our brains, but that's going to involve me giving you a little bit of background to the story. So the thing that I'm most interested in is really about um, how we became the sophisticated kinds of great apes that we are today. We are bipedal walkers, we are sophisticated tool users, we have this incredibly rich cultural um, capabilities that we have. Um, we have a sense of self, we can recognize ourselves as individuals. Um, and we have a very sophisticated communication system in, in our language capabilities. And we also have the ability to keep track of time so we can remember to the past and we can project into the future. But how we became these really interesting um, uh, hominid species is, is still really up for debate. And it is the primary focus of my research. And part of that research depends on working out how our brains actually work. Um, and as you'll all know, we have two sides of our brains, which we call hemispheres, left and right hemispheres. Um, and how they work um, can be considered in, in different ways using different methodologies, 
One of them, as you might well expect, is to look at the way that we develop over time. Um, and this is a linear progression. That means it happens in a straight line. We start as babies and then we um, gain different physical and cognitive uh, abilities, so the way we think, feel, and behave changes as we move through the ages um, and our abilities change, our cognitive capabilities change, and that's what Natasha is going to be talking to you in more depth about in a little bit. But how did our brains get to be the way that they are so that they can develop these really sophisticated capabilities over time? How did they get to be the way they are that we can gain our language skills, for example? And that means we need to use a slightly different approach. And for me, that approach is an evolutionary one. So we can look at the way that we've gained our experiences over time through evolution. And that is a slightly different way of looking at the way the brain works. Um, so to do this, we really want to think about our ancient ancestors. Um, and maybe we could go back and ask them about how their brains worked um, to see how they're similar and different from the way ours do. But, oh, wait a minute, actually, they're all extinct, so we can't do that. OK, so maybe we can dig up their remains and look at their brains and see how they're similar or different to our brains today. And that will give us some clues. That, oh wait, actually, soft tissue doesn't keep, it doesn't fossilize, and it's not really gonna help us so much. So what we can do is maybe look at the artifacts that we find and make some hypotheses about what they were doing, but it doesn't really give us the full story. So we can do something else. Um, we might be able to look back at our former selves by looking at other animal species who are alive today that have an evolutionary history that's shared with us. And those will be our great ape relatives who are here on this planet today, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and bonobos. But before we do that, let's just take a quick look at this slide and just dispel one of the pervading myths about evolution. And that is that it is linear over time, just like development. So there is this common misconception that we descended from monkeys and chimpanzees, and gorillas that we see on our planet today that we share the earth with. And that is patently not true. Evolution is not linear in this way that development is. It's actually more like a tree. So if we think about um, our family trees, we know that we haven't, uh, we don't have this linear progression when we look at our family trees. It is a branching system, right? We can take ourselves and our cousins and we can trace back to where we shared um, a last ancestor and that tells us where we've come from. And it's exactly the same in evolution. It's a branching tree and we can trace back using the branches to see where we shared a last common ancestor and how long ago that was. So our evolutionary history shows that we and great apes are all primates um, and we've descended from our great ape cousins with whom we um, have a common ancestor. So with chimpanzees and bonobos, we can trace our branches back to about 4.6 million years ago where we shared a last common ancestor. Um, and actually that makes us genetically closer to chimpanzees and bonobos than chimpanzees and bonobos are with each other. Because if you trace back their lineage, it's all the way back here six to 8 million years ago where they shared a last common ancestor. Um, so this just kind of shows you a representation of how closely nestled within the great ape family tree that we are and how closely related we are to other great apes that we share this planet with. And that's really interesting because that means that <clears throat> in doing my research, I can think of great apes as having shared common genetic traits with humans 
that were passed down from a last common ancestor. And when I looked into the eyes of other great apes, I have no doubt um, that we have all inherited a similar way of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And this fills me with a broader sense of understanding of my own identity as a human, but the knowledge that my identity is also as a great ape, and it's one that spans back time long before my own birth and even before the emergence of Homo sapiens. And it's really easy when we look to see the similarities between great ape species. And we can look at the physical structures of our hands, of our eyes, of our brains, um, and, and know that we are from the same family. So look at the hands have the same morphology. Uh, there's another myth that humans are the only ones with opposable thumbs. Again, patently untrue. All great apes have opposable thumbs. Main difference is that our thumbs are proportionately larger than other great ape species, making it easier to touch our other fingers and give us different kinds of precision grips. Our eyes, they're all forward facing eyes that are shaped like targets, which make them easy for other, um, other social partners to follow our gaze. Um, and share attention over things in the world around us. And our brains, our brains are shaped and functionally very similar. They are different in sizes, but the human and the chimpanzee brain share most of their different um, anatomy and functional areas. And so that's really important. One of the other commonalities is that our brains are very big proportionately to our body sizes. And that's quite different from other animal species um, and other mammals like cats and rats and dogs, for example. So the fact that we're so genetically close in our, in our makeup and the, the, and, and the shapes of our bodies and the way they work means that um, we can hypothesize that the behaviors that we have in common with the great apes um, uh, were inherited from a shared last ancestor. And that's important because we know that new brain areas don't just emerge out of nowhere. Um, they, we don't build new brain areas because we have a new uh, capability. So like our language capabilities didn't, we didn't just spontaneously uh, uh, develop a new area for language. What happens is that we use old areas that are already existing and we cobble new functions on top of them. We expand them and we adapt them. So something that may look really sophisticated and new, like our language capabilities, will actually be supported by capabilities and structures that are much, much older. And so that forms the basis of a lot of my research, particularly looking at how language did emerge um, and what might have been some of the behaviors that we share with other great apes um, that can tell us about where it emerged from. What were those precursor behaviors from where it emerged? And doing a lot of research in the area and looking at my colleagues' research, um, we've come to realize that there are specific kinds of behaviors uh, that look like um, we, we might have cobbled on top of them and, and used them to support new systems like language. Three of the most uh, sort of um, contenders for being uh, catalysts for language are food preparation, um, tool use, and gestural communication. And the reason why is because all of these activities require structured sequences of actions, right? So we have to do things in the right order in order to get out uh, the, the goal, the intended goal. With food preparation, if you don't do it in the right way, you're not gonna prepare the meal that you had intended. With tool use, if you don't make and use your tools in the right way, you're not going to achieve your goal. Um, and with gesture uh, and communication, if you don't put the gestures in the right order, then you might not give the intended meaning. And all of these kind of action sequences 
are quite similar to the structure that we see in our language capabilities. So for example, um, a sentence, the way we put the words in the correct order is going to dictate the meaning that comes out. So if I say the dog bit Jane, you understand that that means the dog caused injury to Jane. But if I use the same words in a different order, Jane bit the dog, it has a very different meaning, even though the words are the same. So the order and the structure that that makes is very important. And what we found from neuroscience studies is that the actions of, of manipulating objects to achieve a goal, like in food preparation and tool use, and also structured actions like gesture to give an intended meaning, the area of the brain that uh, oversees those processes are highly overlapping with our language areas. So we've got good evidence to suggest. So here are just some examples from videos. This is Jala, he's a silverback gorilla at Port Lim Wild Animal Park. He, he's a Western lowland gorilla and he is preparing nettles to eat. Now, as you might know, stinging nettles are not the kind of thing that you're gonna wanna shove directly in your mouth because of their stingers. But he's, um, he, he's developed a preparation um, a tactic that allows him to fold the stingers into the middle really expertly, make a little parcel and put it in his mouth. And you have to watch carefully because he does it so quickly and accurately with his right hand. And this is a behavior that's now been picked up by the rest of the group and shared so that they can all enjoy stinging nettles. And this is Fufu, she's a female Western lowland gorilla and she's using a tool to get some honey out of this metal receptacle, also at Portland Wild Animal Park. And you can see that she's become quite expert just like us in using this tool. Um, and not only does she find the right kind of stick, but she's able to um, shape the stick to meet her needs uh, and increase the amount of food she gets out. So she will um, break the stick and she will rough up the edges to make it like a little broom so she can scoop out more of the honey. So we think these behaviors were really important historically through evolution um, to, uh, uh, to make us the kinds of great apes that we are today. And here's just a, a little example of gesture happening here between this mum and her son. Um, and you can see that there is a sequence of events. I'm not gonna be able to um, determine exactly what you're, they're saying because I, I don't speak gorilla in that fashion. No one does yet. Um, but you can see that there's a conversation style taking place. And there's a response. And you might even be able to see that she gains his attention, make sure he's looking um, before she does her gesture. And there's a nice little conversation happening there. So these animals um, show very similar behaviors and capabilities to us. Um, and they are um, maybe not so surprising because we share a lot of, of our genetic um, makeup and we also, we know that we have this close evolutionary relationship. But actually, if we look at other animal species who are more distantly related to us, we can see that there are elements of human kinds of behaviors there too. So take, for example, vervet monkeys here on the right, they actually have their own words for different kinds of predators. If they see an eagle, they have an eagle call um, and everybody knows the word for eagle. So they'll all look up to the sky and take the appropriate escape route. route. And if they see, for example, a snake or a leopard, they have their own words for that as well. So these really distinct calls and everybody knows what to do when they hear that alarm call. So they're almost like words like we have. So they have their own little vocabulary, even though it's, it's more fixed um, and smaller. Um, they show different kinds of human traits. 
And uh, corvids, uh, like crows, are incredible tool users. In fact, they're what we call meta tool users, meaning that if they have, say, for example, a stick that isn't long enough to solve their goal, but they can use the short stick to gain access to a bigger stick that will then solve their goal, um, they're capable of doing that. So they have these sub goals that they put in place to solve an overarching goal, which is really complicated. And it takes a lot of resources from your brain because you have to plan um, and you have to keep in your working memory what the overriding goal is. Um, and again, these are very human-like characteristics. So we share a lot of our common traits, not just with our closest living relatives, but I think it goes back even further. So what do we all have in common? Well, what we all have in common is a vertebrate brain. And that vertebrate brain emerged 500 million years ago during the Cambrian period. And it has some distinct um, characteristics. It's, it has kind of these three different areas that we call the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And the hindbrain is the bit right back here, and it deals with things that we don't ever think about. It, it controls our heart rate and our breathing. And then the midbrain is the bit in the middle that takes in information from the external world. Um, and so it's taking in like your vision and your hearing. And then in the forebrain, it, it integrates all that stuff so that we can have an overriding perception of the world around us. Um, and then it's this bit in the frontier of the forebrain that does things like planning. Um, and it's this bit of the front of the forebrain that actually makes up our two hemispheres. So like if I take my brain from here, that old vertebrate brain is on the inside and it's this bit on the front that actually over evolutionary time extended and covered the whole rest of that old vertebrate brain. And that's what makes up our two cerebral hemispheres. That's what we think of as our brain, the right and the left hemispheres. So those bits of the brain, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain have all been squashed and pushed and pulled over evolutionary time in all of these different um, uh, branches of evolution from amphibians to reptiles to birds and all the way up to mammals here. And you can see that the forebrains in the mammals and the birds are the biggest by far. And we think that might be important because that's the planning bit and the bit that formed all that cerebral cortex for our left and right sides of our brain. Um, and they seem to show the most sophisticated behaviors are birds and mammals. So we think that might be important. And that's just a picture of how that old vertebrate brain has been pushed and pulled in the human brain today. So that really big forebrain bit. Okay, so another characteristic of the human brain and all vertebrate brains is that our two hemispheres, left and right, control the opposite sides of our bodies. And that's true of both our motor capabilities and our senses, except for the nose. But we're not gonna talk about the nose today. So the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain control the opposite side of the body. And that's important to note because it means that when we look at the way we move and uh, perceive the environment around us, if we have biases, so say for example, I'm right-handed, um, I use my right hand more for moving objects and stuff, I can infer that that's because the left side of my brain is controlling that. And vice versa, if I'm using my left hand, I can infer that the right side of my brain is controlling that. So we can use our behaviors to infer which sides of our brain are most active. And absolutely both sides of your brain are active in everything that you do, but they have slight dominances. And we think that we have two sides of the brain rather than one big blob um, because it allows some certain advantages. One, it's neurally more efficient that we're not duplicating everything onto the two sides. And it means we've got this extra backup, right? 
It also decreases the instances. If we did copy everything over twice and have this nice backup, then if both sides of your brain wanted to take control, we might have a problem with inconsistent or incompatible responses by the two sides, which would cause us to have really muddled behavior. But what it does also add and afford is that if they have slightly different dominances, then one side can be concentrating on one kind of behavior while the other one concentrates on another kind of behavior and we have a parallel processor, which is very, very useful. And if we didn't have slight dominances, this is the muddling that we can get, which is a very silly gif of Captain Kirk slapping himself, but we'll move on. Okay, so how do we know that they have these dominances? Well, there's been loads of different studies now across many different species. The classic ones are with birds and particularly chicks of how this kind of works. So here's just a really quick example. Um, in classic studies of chicks in the laboratory, these are all behavioral studies, um, we've seen experimenters take chicks, um, healthy born chicks, and they want to see um, the dominances of the left and the right hemispheres. So they've devised specific tasks that they think will um, uh, generate um, the, the left and right hemisphere activation. Um, so for example, to look at the um, uh, left hemisphere, and I think I've got these backwards on my slides, unfortunately, um, we want to see if chicks will have a bias for the way they find food and peck for food. So pecking for food is a motor sequence action, all right? So they have to look at the food, find the food and peck at the food to gain their nourishment. And after checking many, many birds over many, many trials of the birds pecking for food, and these are grains of food that are scattered amongst pebbles. So they have to pay attention. They can look to see which eye the chick uses more often to peck for food. Um, and the eyes on chicks are located on the sides of their heads, not in the front like us, but on the sides of the heads, which means that if they're using one eye, it means the other side of the brain is active. And if they're using the other, vice versa. So testing many, many chicks um, over many, many trials, they found that chicks prefer to use the right eye to peck for food. That means the left hemisphere was more active for that ability. And in another task where they have a fake predator like a cardboard hawk flying over, they wanted to see which eye the chicks prefer to use to look out for predators. And they found after testing many, many chicks over many, many trials that they prefer to use the left eye and the right hemisphere. So what this means is that they're using one eye to look to the ground um, to, to peck for their food, that's the right eye, and they're using one eye to look to the sky to look out for predators, and that's the left eye. And that means that the brain is actually allowing the organism, this little animal, to eat and not be eaten at the same time, which actually makes a perfect survival mechanism, a parallel processor that allows them to eat and not be eaten. So here's just an example, some silly little videos of the right hemisphere um, helping um, animals not be eaten. And in this video, you're going to see cats who think cucumbers are snakes, so one of their predators, and how they react. So here you can see a cat coming into contact with a cucumber thinking it's a snake. And as soon as it enters into the left eye's visual uh, field, uh, they jump away and have this right escape route, which shows that they are right hemisphere dominant for that. And of course, these have been, these are just anecdotal, but lots and lots of studies have shown this. And with the left hemisphere, we're talking about motor sequence dominance. And you can see in this, these videos, oh, this one playing. Let's see, we'll try that again. Ooh. Yeah, doesn't want to play that one. Okay, but you can see with the little frog and the ants coming down on the iPhone that the frog positions itself with a dominance for the right eye and the left hemisphere showing this motor sequence behavior. So what about you, your, your hands? Let's talk about hands again. We've talked about 
um, us having these biases and that they're determined by the functions of the left and the right hemispheres. You all probably know that you're right-handed or left-handed or maybe mixed-handed, but have you ever thought about why that is? Well, we think there is this evolutionary history here about those brain dominances. So if I ask you to just tally up some questions here, don't know if you have a pen and paper, but you can just have a think about it. There's only 10 questions. And I just want you to think if you use your left hand, your right hand, or both hands. So the first question is, which hand do you prefer to use when you write? Probably a no brainer for you. Um, you know that one probably since you were four years old. Question two, which hand do you prefer to use when drawing? Probably the same one for most people. So just keep a little track here. Which hand do you prefer to use when throwing? There's only 10, so you're gonna get a number out of 10 for left or right. Which hand do you prefer to use when using scissors? Which hand do you prefer to use when using a toothbrush? Which hand do you prefer to use when using a knife without a fork? Which hand do you prefer to use when using a spoon? Which hand do you prefer to use when striking a match and opening a container? Which hand is on the lid? Which hand do you prefer to use when threading a needle? And this is the threading hand. Okay. So you should have a number now out of 10 um, for right hand or left hand. Um, the majority, whichever it is, so if you have six or more for right-handed, you're gonna classify yourself as right-handed. Um, uh, six or more for left hand, you can classify yourself as left-handed. And the answer probably won't come as any great surprise to you because you'll have known this answer all your life. But did you realize that your hand biases reflect the dominant processing of the opposite side of your brain? And why and how this happens, we think is due to these evolutionary processes and the two sides of the brain have something to do with that. What we think happens over evolutionary time, going back to the chick studies, is that this evolutionarily old parallel processing um, made the left hemisphere dominant for these feeding motions, these motor action sequencing. And we can see that across um, amphibians and reptiles. And we can see it in right hand use for object manipulation in our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, and in tool using behaviors in chimpanzees and in tool using behaviors in humans. Um, and then also in gestures in humans for communication and so we think that our speaking capabilities for language has a long evolutionary history in left hemisphere dominances for motor action sequencing that we've built upon over many millions of years um, to extend and adapt for our language capabilities. And that's quite exciting. That might be the history of our language capabilities so I spend a long period of my time looking at how other apes use their hands um, and found that most of them are also right-handed like us. This is Cayenne, um, a, a four-year-old orangutan from, from Twy Cross Sioux. You can see she's using preference for her right hand to get the nut out of the puzzle maze. And here is another example. This is Tibbs at Port Lim Wild Animal Park. Now she's a bit more sophisticated, she's older, she's using a tool and she's using mixed hand use. So she's using both fingers and, um, <clears throat> and uh, the tool and she's checking the maze and using lots of planning, trying to not get it stuck in the trap. She's checking that at the bottom. So lots of stuff going on here with her motor action sequencing, which is really exciting to study the way she uses her hands. And this is um, uh, Tuli at uh, Twycross. And she, like 10% of our population, is left-handed for her tool use and motor action sequencing. Um, so the numbers that I'm talking about today are patterns that we see across the population. But there's a lot of individual variation. And we need to bear that in mind as well. Um, and that is also very, very normal. So, that's the left hemisphere's evolutionary history, but what about the right hemisphere? 
Well, we think a very similar thing has happened. When we go back to the chick studies and we see that the right hemisphere and the left eye were dominant for that fight or flight response to predators, we can see that's true again for our amphibians, our reptiles. And we also see it in mammals, sea mammals, uh, land mammals. And we also see it um, across our, our chimpanzee and other great ape relatives in the form of how they watch their different social partners and also how in humans now we recognize other individuals and not just their faces, but their emotional states as well. So we think again, there's just been this long evolutionary history of how our social emotional capabilities came to be. And they rest upon and are supported by this evolutionarily old right hemisphere dominance for fight or flight capabilities. So a last little bit just for fun, looking at faces for you. Let's see what kind of preference you might have. I'm gonna show you two pictures in each set and you just write down A or B to see which one you think looks more expressive. So this is A and this is B. Sit centrally in about arm's length from your screen. A, B, the same question. This is question one, A, B. Okay, let's move on to question two. Again, tell me which one you think looks more expressive. A, B. A, B, don't think too much, A, B. Okay, let's move on to question three. Same again, which one looks more expressive? A, B, A, B. One more time, A, B. And fourth one, let's do it again. A, B, A, B, A, B. Okay, here's a slightly different one. Which one looks more expressive here, A or B? Don't take too long. It should be a quick reflex action. Which one looks more expressive? Okay, here's another question. If I were to give this to you to hold, and I said, hold it like this, which side would you put the top on? So this bit, would it face into your left arm or your right arm? And same question here. If I gave you this infant baby doll to hold, would you place it in your left arm or your right arm? Okay, so here are our answers. There are no wrong answers, but here's a way to evaluate which side of your brain is more dominant for looking at social kinds of stimuli. If you picked the green highlighted ones, that means that you preferred the expressions when they were on the left side of the screen. This means you've got a left uh, eye bias, which indicates a right hemisphere dominance. And if you chose um, the cradling stimuli in the left, that also indicates a right hemisphere dominance. And if you chose the other ones, the other side, that means you've got uh, the left hemisphere dominance. So you should be able to tally up here whether or not you have one, two, three, four, five lefts and six and seven lefts if you had all lefts or a mix and match of the two. Most people choose the lefts on this, the green ones and left for the cradling. And we think this is an evolutionary dominance that we see um, in most people that comes from way, way back from our fight or flight capabilities that has kept us vigilant of looking at faces in the environment, understanding expressions because we need to know how to respond, particularly when they're angry or looking threatening because it might help us to survive. And those sorts of behaviors have um, been preserved in humans. And we see them all the time in the kinds of behaviors that we still do today, like cradling babies. And we think it's not just because we're right-handed and want our right hand free because left-handers also prefer over here. What we think is the issue is that we can determine more quickly and accurately the state of that infant by using the left side of our vision and the right hemisphere. 
um, because it can more quickly and accurately allow us to respond. And it's true in other species too, gorillas and chimpanzees, um, bonobos, they all cradle with a preference to the left as do other species like African flying foxes um, and even sea mammals. And we also use this behavior uh, as we navigate our social spaces with a preference to keep other individuals on the left side of space so we can suss them out more quickly and easily. So these are really important behaviors that have lasted through time. And if you've kept both your scores from your, your hands and your faces, you can see whether or not you still have a standard vertebrate brain, just like the chicks I showed you with the left for motor action and the right for fight or flight by just seeing how you pair. If you had a right hand dominance and a left eye dominance, you've got a standard vertebrate brain organization like most of the population. But you might have a mix, a right and a right, a left and a left or a reversed. These are less common, but still significantly found in our human population, probably because we're not needing to run away from predators anymore and things have shifted a bit, but still very important for allowing us to see where our behaviors have come from and how our brains are organized. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. I think I've gone a little bit over and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Julie. That was awesome. <laughs> I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I'm just going to say, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the in the question bar. Um, there is no such thing as a silly question. Um, so do ask anything that you'd like related to Julie's talk. <laughs> um, I had a question. You're, so you're talking about the, the dominance of the two cerebral hemispheres. And I was doing the quiz, as hopefully lots of other people were, and seeing that I was a I seem to be more of a mix, but I was, I was thinking about, I've heard that some people are kind of left brain or right brain. And I just wasn't sure how true that is. You said that obviously some of us do have a tendency to, 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 to left or right hemispheres, but is there such a thing as a, a left brain or a right brain? Are we born with it? And will it impact how we learn or should we learn in a different way? Yeah, so many good questions. Um, so first thing I should say is that, again, both sides of your hemispheres are always involved in everything we do. There are these subtle dominances, which we can draw out only for context specific activities. So it's like, if we're using objects, then I'm right handed, but actually, you know what, if I'm not using objects and I'm like picking my nose or, you know, scrubbing my chin or whatever, actually we end up being more mixed or left-handed as a population because it's not the same context. It doesn't require goal-orientated object manipulation and tool use. It's more of a social thing. Maybe I'm a little stressed or, or if I go and hug somebody or if I <gasps> cover my mouth because I'm scared, or, then you get much more mixed. We're not right-handed in that way. And also our handedness and our dominances are on a continuum. They go from mild to, to strong and everybody's different. And some of what we think is that the, the, the tendency for the dominance is, is evolutionary preset. Okay. And we see that like even babies in utero will suck their thumbs and that will be their dominant hand for, for motor stuff, <laughs> like with 80% accuracy. Um, but the way we interact with our environment absolutely influences how weak or strong those dominances become. And there are so many left-handed people as well who, who have um, very different uh, profiles with regard to our dominances, um, but they're not negative ones in any sense. And in fact, there are more left-handed um, professional sports players, um, artists, politicians, um, potentially because they've actually got more communication between the two sides in a slightly different way than, than our us standard brain people who are a bit boring. They're parallel, parallel processing. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Um, and can you tell me, I love the, seeing the research you've been doing with the chimpanzees. How did, how, I mean, that's, that's the question is how did you get into evolutionary psychology and doing this, this area of research? Um, <clears throat> It, it, it's been a long and wiggly road. 
Um, it, it's, I've been um, chimpanzee fascinated since I was about eight years old. Like I have just, all, I, I don't know, I've just been completely drawn to want to understand them. I want to, uh, I grew up during the time when there, there were all of those um, uh, ape sign language studies going on. And in fact, like researchers were taking um, infant chimpanzees and raising them with their children to see like how many similar behaviors they would have. And um, obviously like ethically, we wouldn't do that today, but, but the outcomes were, were really kind of quite, quite humorous. Like in one situation, um, the baby, I think um, was called Donald and the chimpanzee uh, Gaia or Gua, Gua um, and they were neck and neck for their motor behavior. Like their motor development was very similar all the way through toddlerhood. In fact, the chimpanzee was much better uh, in, in lots of in lots of ways than, than the child. But what they really wanted to see would the chimpanzee learn how to talk, which we, we know they can't physiologically talk in the same way we can based on their anatomy and, and also lo lots of other factors. Um, but what happened was that the child started learning chimpanzee calls um, and they, they put an end to the study because they, that wasn't going the direction they had intended. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I started watching those programs and reading those books and becoming absolutely fascinated and thinking, why are they doing it like that? Why aren't we learning chimpanzee? Like we should be learning chimpanzee. That will be more interesting and, and allow us to understand how we became the way we are today because we share common ancestors uh, and we can't go and ask those common ancestors because they're they're extinct but but we can have this link with our with our closest living cousins here who are living on earth today um, and so I think that set things in motion and I, and I did cognitive science and psychology for my studies um, and I wanted to learn more about the brain so I did that um, and whenever there was an opportunity to work with with animals and learn more about animals I always always took them so it's been a wiggly road and I'm still finding my way there um, but I, I intend to hopefully kind of um, keep shaping my, my journey for for ever as long as I can. <laughs> well, that's what makes good science as well, being interested in it <laughs> and following it. We have um, a couple of questions coming in. So um, I think Alexandra asked, thank you, Gillian, for a very interesting talk and has a question about has our brain changed in the last 40,000 years? If there, if there is no evidence of change, isn't that unusual? Okay, so I'm, I'm not an expert in this area and I, I would... Um, I would defer to some of my colleagues like Simon Green, but my understanding is no, there hasn't been a massive change in our brains. And in fact, if you had a baby that was, was 40,000 years old and you raised it in a modern human family, you would notice no difference. Uh, what has changed is culture and our, um, uh, the amount of objects we have in the world around us, the way we interact with them and um, our our more sophisticated language that has emerged somewhere between 70 and 100,000 years ago where, where we see that happening, or we think we see that happening. Um, so I, I really think it's, it's our engagement with the environment and with the other individuals in our environment that has um, shifted our cognitive abilities. Got time for one quick question before we move on to Natasha's. Another question's popped up. Um, there was a time in which a student, Alberto, has asked, there was a time in which students were forced to use their right hand to write. And that, I think my dad, my dad's left handed. So he went through this. Does that somehow affect their way, the way their brains work? Again, this is a really difficult question to answer. It's a great one because it's affected many, many people, um, particularly throughout the 1950s when people had literally had one of their arms restricted so that they were forced to use the right hand. Um, it, it obviously is gonna impact the way you develop for sure. But we also need to remember that our brains are super plastic as well and can deal with a lot of these things. So think about somebody who's actually had an injury um, they will get on and, and develop the, the precise skills needed um, using the non-dominant hand when, when required. I think 
what happens with with this group of individuals is that you've got this combination of, of physical changes, but also massive psychological changes that are going on due to the trauma of, of having this kind of restriction inflicted upon you. Um, so I think it's it's a it's difficult one to answer. We don't know um, the the true nature of it, but it will have had it will have had um, an effect on the way those individuals developed. It's a good point, actually, and I guess something that comes through from your from your talk is that our brains are very adaptable. Like that's what's magical about our brains is that we can we can adapt. Um, okay, thank you very much, Jilly. So, um, and you'll come back on, and we'll have a, a little chat after Natasha's talk. Lovely. So, I'll now hand over to and welcome back Natasha Kirkham, so Dr. Natasha Kirkham, um, from the Department of Psychological Sciences at Birkbeck. And Natasha, I believe you're going to tell us all about how babies' brains or how babies develop over time. So over to you, Natasha. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now and I'll ask Emma the same thing if just make sure that I'm actually sharing it properly. <laughs> sure. Okay, let's start. So you can see it. Brilliant. Perfect. Okay. Yes, I'm... Uh, uh, Natasha and I'm a developmental psychologist and I work at Birkbeck just like uh, Jilly and Emma but also I um, work at the Center for Brain and Cognitive Development um, which is a specialized center that looks at development from a variety of different perspectives. So today I am going to talk to you about um, what I do so developmental psychology, so what it is, um, what we study. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the baby develops from before they're born up and through a little bit of infancy. One of our main themes that I'm very interested in, which is nature versus nurture. So are we born with it or is there an environmental um, impact? And obviously having listened to what Jilly was talking about, you get a real sense of um, the fact that there is a lot of environmental impact as well and also how we actually run our experiments. So working, how do we work with the babies and what do we do and what can we actually find out? Okay, so what is developmental psychology? Well, basically it is the study of change over time. It is sort of the closest to a combination of say philosophy and science that I could think of, because although it is a scientific field and we run actual scientific experiments and we think about the sort of the data, et cetera, we're also asking questions like, what is the origin of thought? And why are we who we are? You know, how did we become us? Um, so why do we act the way that we do? You know, why do we have particular talents um, that we have that someone else might not have? Why do we like the things we like? So why do I prefer um, savory over sweet and someone else might have a different preference? Why are we like our siblings or not like our siblings, like our parents, not like our parents? So all of these kinds of things, what makes you, you over time from before you were born up until, you know, all the way throughout your life, that is developmental psychology. Effectively, to put it into some nice little pictures, it's how we go from this, and this is you at four weeks after conception, to this. <laughs> to this, which is the same baby four but years later. Time, and this child clearly now has, has language, color. has her own thoughts, walking in, has motor day. skills, has, trust me, her own opinions. So how think. does that happen? And one thing to think about is that baby you saw crying, who was 20 minutes old, no language, no idea who they are, what they are, who you are, what you are, where they are, don't even understand that they are a thing, let alone um, have thoughts, right? So we've got this system that comes into the world with no information about what the environment is going to be. And within the first four years of life becomes these independent individuals with clear ideas and clear thoughts. And it is the most developmental change that you will ever experience throughout your life. So it's always been something we've been interested in. It is effectively about us, right? So we like to think about ourselves. So we've always been interested in how we develop and change. And certainly early philosophers spent a long time talking about it, whether we are born with all our traits and talents or whether they develop over time. And if you saw Emma's talk a couple of weeks ago about genetics, you would have 
learned about some of the new research techniques that have come on, on board in the last little while that has increased our understanding of development. If you haven't watched it, I suggest you go back and find it on our website. It's a really great talk. And also we now have something called embryology, which is actually the study of prenatal development. And that has allowed us to look at exactly what is happening. So three days after conception, after sperm and egg meet and a baby is conceived, we look like this. These are, you know, what, 16, 18, 20 cells. So dividing cells, and that's you three days after conception. So actually, let me take you through what we've looked up like at certain points and how big we were. So this is an embryo. So this is four weeks of age after conception. You're the size of a poppy seed at this point. And what you can see, and you have drawn some little albums to show you, is the beginnings of things. So you have, you still have a tail. Um, and you've got sort of little flippers on the side, but you also have the beginning of where your heart is going to be. And you have a disc in the top part, which is going to be where your eye is going to develop. This is, quite frankly, one of our prettiest faces. Um, and you are the size of a blueberry right now. And we're getting a little bit of face development. So between five and eight weeks of age. Um, and what you can see is um, the beginnings of the brain, right? Um, so you can see sort of the eye discs have darkened. You can see the beginnings of a nose and you can see the beginnings of, of sort of systems starting to happen up at the top. At nine weeks, you're now an olive. And I've pointed out the umbilical cord, which is bringing all of the nutrients to baby from uh, the mother's system. And you can see that you're still very top heavy, lot of head, but you can start to see the size of an olive. And you can see in that picture, which has clearly been blown up, little tiny toes. 11 weeks, you are now uh, the size of a lime and you can see a nice rib cage happening here. And if you look at the top, you see the start of what's starting to actually look like a human brain. It's very, very undifferentiated, very smooth, not the kind of wriggles and, and um, you know, rivets and stuff that you would see in a, a, a mature brain, but it's starting to take on the, the look. 16 weeks, avocado sized. You can see veins going through. You can see the brain is starting to look a little more differentiated there. Uh, you can see nose, lips, eyes, again, fingers and toes. Potato sized, there you are. Banana sized at 20 weeks. And um, Jilly mentioned about the fact that, you know, you start sucking your thumb even in utero. And so we can maybe assume that this baby is gonna be right-handed. And so this, this baby is now um, sucking thumb. And actually this is incredibly important from a developmental perspective because they're getting feedback, tactile feedback from putting their thumb in their mouth. They're learning something about their own body. They're starting to swallow their own um, 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 amniotic fluid and then they pee it out. And what that does is it kickstarts the kidneys. They breathe in the fluid, which starts to kickstart the lungs. So they're actually helping themselves develop at this stage. And we get up to 28 weeks and now you're a butternut squash. And this is what they sort of term viability. So by 28 weeks, you know, we, we feel confident that if you were born, although you, you know, most um, babies go between sort of 37 and 40 weeks, by 28 weeks, the systems are in place that you could um, survive birth. Obviously you want to stay and cook for as long as possible. Okay. So that's sort of moving you through the um, in utero stage. And now let's think about what happens once you're born. So the big main theme in developmental psychology is nature versus nurture. Are we hardwired from the beginning or does our environment make us who we are? So is it all brain or do we come into the world with um, some systems in place that allow us to make use of the environment that's around. So this is just um, a, a clip that I, I took off the internet that's sort of looking at uh, different functions that we could think might be in parts of the brain. There are lots of different interpretations of this throughout neuroscience, uh, the field of neuroscience. But I thought this was a nice kind of um, uh, optic because it shows all the different things that people have kind of placed in different parts of the brains from the visual cortex on the right-hand side of the screen, you know, I've got reading, uh, there's some memory stuff, visual memories, auditory memories, the front part of the brain, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of 
a little more sort of what we consider our higher cognitive processes of so creative thought, writing, intellect, all of this kind of thing. So we ask ourselves, is it really necessary for a baby to be born with everything um, functionalized like that and localized like that? And we talked, or Jilly talked a lot about there being plasticity in the brain and there is plasticity. And so one thing that makes the brain so fantastic is that it can adapt to things. So if you were a small baby and something was to happen and you would have a brain injury because you're at a, in a position where your brain is so plastic, you can make a lot of changes in your brain at that point to compensate. So one idea is that we do not come into the world with this level of localization, but we come into the world with a system in place that allows us to take advantage of the environment as it comes towards us, allows us to take um, advantage of all of the colors and the objects and um, being taught stuff, you know, either through schooling or through families or through playing with friends, for example. So just to take a step back for a quick second, I'm gonna very briefly discuss some issues when talking about nature versus nurture. So we discuss it a lot in developmental psychology, in cognitive neuroscience and in across our fields, but it does get picked up on and the media has a tendency to like to think that it's either one or versus the other and sort of suddenly, you know, parenting is what's going to change a child or there's nothing you can do because it's completely genetic. And they do enjoy kind of pitting one of these things against the other. Um, as it happens, for the most part, we genuinely believe that it is a wonderful um, interaction between these two things. It's not one versus the other, but it's worth thinking about that when you're reading stuff online about, you know, good parenting can present um, antisocial behavior, right, which is which is nice. But if you actually look at that article, it turns out what they're looking at is monkeys. Um, and we know that there's a lot of, of similarities, of course, but it's also kind of glossing over the fact that we don't that we're, we're making a big deal out of something that might not actually be true. Okay. Okay, so I'm now gonna talk about some research and I've picked one area of, of our field called object permanence because I think it's a really nice one. It, it's very, very simple. And the first thing that people think when I say, okay, so how do we learn that objects are real things? Everyone goes, okay, fine, they're objects, who cares, right? But actually, if we go back to that 20 minute old baby who's never seen an object, has never heard, well, she's heard sounds, but has never really seen anything in her world really before being born. How does she learn that objects are things that continue existing? How does she learn that objects are things that exist when you can't see them, that they're real, that they're whatever? All of these kinds of ideas that we take completely for granted. How does a baby learn this? So I'm gonna take you through some of this research. Um, before we do, I wanna go back to the brain idea. So what we have in our baby brain, right, is a, is a brain that is developing and it develops at different parts, develop at different on different time scales. So the visual cortex, because I'm gonna be showing you um, uh, research that involves babies looking at things or trying to find things, the visual cortex is what processes visual information. So light and color and motion and objects. And this develops very early. However, the part of the brain that makes sense of this visual information develops much slower throughout infancy and childhood and on into adolescence. And so what that tells you is that there's gonna be a little bit of a difference here between seeing and interpreting. Okay, so how am I actually gonna do this research? Well, one of the things we use, one of the methods we used is called eye tracking and it allows us to see where a baby is looking. So the eye tracker um, picks up on the most reflective thing in its field. It's sort of like a camera picking up on, on what it can see. And the most reflective thing on a face of the eyes, eyes are incredibly reflective. And what it does is it look, it places, well, in this particular one places these crosshairs, not on the eyeball, obviously, but the crosshairs are placed onto um, the screen that the researcher is looking at. So baby is just freely looking at the screen. And what we get is a picture of some crosshairs that show where baby is looking. So what I'm gonna show you now is you can see that crosshair that's where this particular baby is looking at the screen. So this particular experiment is just asking a baby to watch a ball 
move back and forth across the screen. And in the middle of the screen, there's a box and the ball moves behind the box and comes out the other side. Super simple. If I showed this to you, you may find it a slightly boring thing to look at, but your eyes will do something automatically. They'll follow the ball until it hits the first edge of the box. And then your eyes will leap over to the second edge of the box and predict the ball coming out. All right, I want you to tell me what you think this four month old understands about this situation. So there's the ball and there's the little crosshair showing where baby is looking. Whoop, okay. Oh, baby's got it, they see it. And then they just wait, oh, then it comes out and then they just wait, oh, there it is. Right, so there's a lot of just waiting around for the ball to come out. And although this goes on and on and on, and trust me, we did this for a very long time for these lovely babies, they never get any better at this. They're not learning that anything is happening during this particular scene. Two months later, we have a six month old in the lab. And I want you to have a look at this six month old's eye tracking. All right, so this baby is doing what actually you would be doing as someone who's presumably older than six months of age is it's called a ballistic eye movement is that you just move your eyes very quickly to the other side of the, of the, the box. So that's great. And what is this telling us? It is telling us that some development occurred over those two months. And we think that's because they've just had two months more experience with the world. So all the babies could see the ball going back and forth, that we know, but it's not until six months of age that they can predict where it will go. So we have this combination of brain and environment. All right, so fine. So they've learned everything they need to know about objects and we can move on. Well, I'm gonna tell you one more. I'm gonna take you through a few more things. So we've got a six month old that can predict that ball coming out from the other side of the box. And that looks pretty good. In fact, it looks adult-like. So now what I'm gonna do is switch it up. So we use a different method, which is called the search method, which you know, is asking a baby to search for something. It's, it's not complicated. And what we do is we take an object and we hide it and we ask the baby to find it. So let me show you this video. Baby does not know where that object is. Not around. This is a very good thing to remember if you have a six He's very happy to have it back. That's it. He's still going to find it. Okay, so we have a Now, watch what happens. Decides he's going to play with him. Up and surprises himself by finding the object that he wanted to play. Super excited and found it by himself. Well, play. Now, this is what's quite interesting and different from that four month old who didn't seem to learn. Once, he found it once. Uh, So we're watching actual online movies from here. The minute I distract him, he has no idea where it is. Okay. So that is a very basic object permanence task. And for six month olds, they just can't find it once you have hidden it. But you did see this nice sort of online learning and it's and he kind of taught himself there by mistake, picks up the, the, the cloth, finds the toy, well, the phone, right? Okay, so we've got a six month old who can predict a ball going back and forth behind a box, but now we have a six month old who can't seem to find an object when it's being hidden in plain sight. So now let's move up a little further along the age group. Now we've got some a nine month old. Now this video, it's a, an actual VHS video. It's a little old, so bear with it because it's a little crackly. It's back from when I was, before I went to um, do my postgraduate work, I did a research assistantship. Um, and this was one of the, the tasks that I ran. It's called the A not B task. 
And the way it is set up is that that nice little desk right there that has two wells in it, an A well and a B well. And what you do is you make sure that the baby is old enough to know how to find an object when it's hidden. You then hide it in one location twice, and then you switch it to another location. So let's have a look at this. So he's old enough. He's old enough so he can find the object. When it's okay. Really? Right. Ask so I'm the Hey, Natasha, Jilly here. Just give us a quick recap when the video finishes because your audio over the video is really hard to hear you. So sorry about the audio. So let me give you a little recap about that. So that is the A not B task. And what it means is that you place an object in one location a couple of times, and then they search for it. And by nine months of age, they should be able to find it. But once you move it to the other location, they continue to go back to the first location, even though they're not getting rewarded for it. You know, they're not getting to play with it. They don't get to pick it up, for example. And then after doing that for five or six times, 
I made it easier by giving him a visual clue. There's only one covering. So he knows it has to be there and he goes and gets it. But the minute I go back to the two covers, he can't do it again. He goes back to the first warded place, which was on the left-hand side for him. So this particular task, which has been around for a very long time, has been the subject of lots and lots of discussion with people talking about it as motivational, talking about it in terms of working memory. So maybe the baby cannot keep in mind where they last saw it, talking about motor development. So maybe they just learn this weird thing of, I reach to the left, I get a toy. I reach to the left, I get a toy. And they can't kind of jog themselves out of that. But what it does sort of show you is that regardless of their being able to do something like find an object when it is hidden, it's just not that simple. There's still something else missing, right? So what you have seen going from four months to six months, six months to nine months, is this nice development in achieving something. You see it, you can interpret it and predict it. You can find it if you find it yourself, but you can't if you get distracted, you can now find it. But if I mess around by moving it from place to place, you can't find it again. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that you need to learn about objects to get more experience with them in order to fully understand them. And again, I think this is a nice example because it sort of allows you to see something that is relatively simple to people who are not babies, which is just understanding objects to see how difficult it is during the course of development. So you do need the environment, but you also need the structures in your brain to help you process the incoming information. So we do truly believe that it is this nice mix between nature and nurture. And now what we're interested in is how that actually works. So do one, does one thing win out over another based on context, um, based on time of development, based on maturation, for example? And these are the kinds of questions we are continuing to ask. So in sum, um, to understand how we develop and how we become who we are, it is essential to study under and understand prenatal development, not just development after you're born, genetics, brain development, and it is extraordinarily important to understand the surrounding environment. The baby grows up in the middle of everything. They do not grow up in a vacuum. They grow up surrounded by siblings or pets, parents, grandparents, um, homes, uh, you know, parks, school, friends, et cetera, et cetera. They grow up surrounded by so much information and this allows the brain to develop and learning to occur. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha, that was awesome. <laughs> And um, thank Sorry you for about the audio mess up. I didn't yeah, really I, try, I tried to communicate and then I didn't want to interrupt, but Ginny thankfully stepped in. Um, I think it was all clear. Yeah, and, sorry. Um, can I just ask a quick question before I go and see what questions have been posted in the chat? Obviously, you do a lot of research with babies, and it did bring to mind the phrase never work with babies or animals or children with animals. Um, how difficult is it doing scientific research with babies? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you have to be very creative because obviously they're not going to talk to you, right, and give you the answers. And um, even when they don't talk, when they do talk to you, you know, they, you're not always sure that they're giving you the answers that, that, to the questions that you're asking. Um, so it's a very creative field. You have to come up with some really interesting ways in which you can get at these questions, you know, interesting methodologies and techniques. But it is, you know, it takes a while. So, you know, if you work with adults, you can, you can get, you know, 20, 40, 60 adults to come in and run on a study, you know, within a week or two. But actually, you know, babies, you have to, it's, it's a much bigger deal. You know, you have to, and there's a lot of ethical implications as well, right? So you have to make sure that baby is enjoying themselves. I mean, they're there because you, they don't know why they're there, right? So it's, it's all about making sure that they're happy and, and comfortable. And also that you're asking appropriate questions. Um, and that you're getting the answers to the questions you're asking because, you know, they're just looking at a screen and we're trying to interpret what it is they're thinking. So it's, it's, it's a very creative and complicated field. I love it. I mean, I really love it. I love working with the babies. They're wonderful. Yeah, you, touched, you touched on the ethics there, but I'm guessing you, you asked the parents as well. There's, there's some consent from the parents there and you're making sure their, their babies are happy. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, there's all these like, stories from sort of 
back in the day, like the little Albert study from God knows when back in the day where they, you know, you know, they sort of scared a baby with, with clown masks to make him cry and to see if they could condition a fear response. You can't do that, right? Like that's not okay, right? So yeah, we, we are very, very careful. We talk to the parents, we answer all the questions. The minute baby looks, you know, babies cry for lots of reasons. They cry because they're bored, they're tired, they're hungry, whatever. But the minute baby is not happy, everything stops and you know we we try again another time or not or whatever so yeah there's a lot of consent involved um, we do have a question posted on the on the on the chat bar um so someone asked which was i think related to the the ball disappearing and it's an interesting question that they said if you were then to change the color of the ball when would the baby be able to measure or have a response to knowing that the color of the ball had changed so would you be able to kind of, I guess, record surprise that that visual input has changed in any way? That's a really, really nice question. And I'm so thrilled that I can actually answer it because that study that I showed you with the ball going back and forth, we actually ran it um, many conditions in which we changed the color, we changed the shape, we changed the texture. And I love the four month olds, but they never figure it out. But actually the surprise element is super, super useful um, that it does promote learning in a way that um, uh, we hadn't thought about before. So for just to go to that A not B paradigm where that, that baby just kept looking in the wrong place, kept looking in the wrong place. If you change the toy, which is sort of effectively what you were saying about the ball and the box, if you change the toy, now they can, you know, now they can actually do it. So there's a sort of a surprise element that's a great question because a surprise is an incredibly good learning motivator and it does work i'm gonna remember that for my own children <laughs> it work on nine-year-olds and um, thank you very much so should we welcome jilly back now um and have a little quick discussion yeah hi thank you <laughs> that was a really cool talk natasha thanks really enjoyed that um so Natasha, you did touch on this actually just, just a moment ago in your reply, but I don't know if we want to kind of discuss the creativity question. So perhaps Julie, you can go first talking about how you think creativity plays a role in, in your research. Um, yeah, sure. I, and, and I'm going to kind of bounce off of what Natasha already said about the fact that children um, that, that we're interested in studying, obviously we want to look at the development of things like language. So then you don't want to use language as a way to interrogate them because you're trying to look at how that thing develops. So, so sorry, we've got Wolfie joining us now. Um, um, so, oh, sorry. Oh, um, and working with great apes is a very similar thing. Uh, we can't use language. So we need to be really creative about the way we design studies that can get at the questions that we want to get at. Um, and they have, make fair comparisons across great apes and humans. Um, and that, that requires a lot of creativity. So, so those puzzle boxes that you saw, um, so my postdoc and I, Dr. Georgie Donati, um, we develop those puzzle boxes in, in, they might look rather simplistic, but actually the amount of consideration and creativity that went into developing them so that they actually do get at the questions we're interested in answering was phenomenal. And we had to think about architecture and we had to think about colors and we had to think about sizes of things because all apes have different size fingers. Um, and like what you can get at and where and how that's going to impact their behavior. Wow. Yes, you too. Um, and like, uh, you know, when can they use a tool versus just the finger and can we force those things by the way we organize the shape and, and, and layout of them. Um, and all of that took a massive amount. And I loved that. That was such a brilliant part of the study. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it definitely does take a lot of creativity. I don't know if Natasha you want to add to that but I guess you've, you've, you've already kind of commented on yeah I mean it is and one of the other things is is that you always sort of have to pilot stuff right I mean I'm jelly would be the same so you know just because you think a baby is going to find something fun to do doesn't necessarily mean the baby's going to find it fun to do right I mean I've had I've had what I thought were fantastic um, paradigms you put the baby in front of it and they're like yeah, I'm really not looking yeah. at that. that is boring, right? And you're like, ah, oh, okay. And you have to think about other things or just silly things. Like, you know, we, for a while, we used to always have some nice sounds in the background because we thought it kept them 
interested and, and happy, but actually what you find is that it just distracts them and they just, their eyes wander all over the place and, you know, all sorts of stuff that you just have to kind of play with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it goes not just to the way we design the studies, but also the questions that we're asking. So like thinking of um, how we arrive at new research questions and develop our, our theories around them also have an element of creativity involved. And, and sometimes it's, it's the way you develop those questions that, that lead to the most interesting research results. So that, that can also involve a, a sense of creativity. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit mindful of time, Chili. Does it stop at 12? It doesn't stop at 12. If we've got questions, we can carry on. Um, but yeah, we, we, should, we should aim to wrap up, I'd say, in the next you know, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so we have one more question um, that's on the chat. Um, oh, I, actually, I think this question will apply to both of you, which is how reliable are the theories you develop from these experiments when you're not sure what the subjects are actually thinking? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, it's not only is it a great question, it's a really, really topical question. It's something that in developmental psychology we are thinking about a lot. So um, one of the things that we do in our field is replicate. And that's our replicate, replicate, replicate. So just because I found that with the four month olds, but that's great, it looks wonderful, but I, I need, I like, I replicate it again in my own lab, but also other labs will then go ahead and use the same paradigm and replicate. And we are very much involved in a process in which we make sure all of our stimuli is uploaded to repositories so people can go and get them. We have um, open access to our data so other um, scientists can find the data and look at it if they wanted to reanalyze it, for example. So there's a lot of collaboration and that, that's something I don't know happened has always happened, right? Because there's also of course competition in science because of publications and, and grants and stuff. But the push right now is to make sure that what we're finding is not only um, real, but it generalizes. So just because I found it in a bunch of four month olds that came to my lab when I was at Cornell University doesn't necessarily mean that this is gonna happen in other, part, other places. And so it's all about population representation. It's about making sure that other, labs can replicate it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's incredibly important. And, and there are occasions and it's happened with my research and lots of people's research where things don't replicate or people do something or like, actually, I think it's this and not that. And of course, that's how science works, right? Is that you find something, then somebody else disproves it and then you find something else and you kind of move on like that. And, and it can be the fact that actually what we found is a real thing it's just not the thing we thought it was. So we've actually measured something slightly different than somebody else. And that's really interesting. And I think another point to add is that just because you found something in maybe Western living four month olds, like, like Natasha was saying, it might be different um, on the other side of the globe, but also it might change over developmental time. And so we have to take and keep in consideration that these things are not static. You know, they're not snapshots. We are dynamic cognitive systems. We change with the environment around us as well. And so looking at that developmental trajectory that we used to think stopped kind of in adolescence, we now know goes beyond and there are still massive changes through adulthood and, and old age. Um, and so none of these things should be thought of as like, this is the way it is and it never changes. It is completely a dynamic system. This yeah. is, I mean, we do the same in, in, in behavior genetic research, right? We're thinking about these same issues, being able to generalize, not looking at one particular type of population in one particular type of environment, thinking more broadly about the developmental context. It's a great question. Um, I'll just check uh, if there's another, Question. I think there's one more question if we've got time to ask, um, answer. Hold on, my screen's just loading. Uh, ah, okay, this is an interesting question, which I know some of this research is potentially coming online, um, particularly in the baby lab, but someone's asked, can AI help in our studies or artificial intelligence or kind of data-driven predictions? Are they being used at all in, in, in our research? Yeah, I mean, it's really not my field of expertise, but the sort of short and simple answer is yes. Um, and we've always, um, the broader we, clearly I'm not doing it, but connections modeling and um, neural networks. And we've all always in the field used those as ways of um, 
of predicting behavioral outcomes and also of trying to bolster ideas about hypotheses, right? Um, and certainly as the technology moves forward, it's becoming much, um, much better and much more precise. And so that's sort of my simple answer. I don't actually do it, but I do know that this is stuff that is being worked on right now, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just building models of how we think the underlying kind of neural mechanisms might be working and, and posing different hypotheses and building computer models that will run those simulations and see if they get the kinds of outputs that our humans get. Um, so we've got colleagues at Birkbeck who are working on exactly those yeah. sorts of approaches now, but, but similar to Natasha, it's not my primary field either, yeah. although oh, I'd love someone to take my data and do some modeling with it and see <laughs> if that could be helpful. Although it is sort of worth saying that in terms of creating an actual baby brain that develops the way a baby does, we are light years away from being able to actually do that. I mean, I wish we weren't because I really love sci-fi and I really would love to see that happen. But it is an, it is an astonishingly complicated system. So when we do modeling, it's really very simplistic from that perspective. It's looking at sort of a very a small part of behavior that we're modeling some outcomes for. That also touches on, I guess, part of the, the nature of research that often isn't discussed, which is quite collaborative. So you've both just said that you know, this is absolutely part of our part of our field. And it's really interesting, but we're not specialists in it. But, my, you know, you're working with colleagues who are, for example, and I think that's in terms of kind of myth busting about scientists is actually we are quite collaborative and we don't know everything. <laughs> It is always this constant kind of learning process for us um, and, and our colleagues and, and talking to each other and communicating and replicating other people's studies and having this kind of constant dialogue and communication, which is really going to help science and help us ask the questions that we want to ask. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. I think I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. Um, so if you're happy to um, just Oh, I don't know, Jilly, you wanted to sum up? I, yeah, I, well, I want to thank you, Emma, for, for stepping in and hosting today's sessions. Um, <clears throat> it's been a, a really lovely month of Science Saturdays. Um, and so I want to end by just saying um, what we were here to do, um, and, and that is offer um, free short talks aimed at sharing science with, with the public. And we've been in collaboration with the Me Human Project and the National Saturday Club. Just to remind you, the Me Human Project is a public engagement project focused around sharing science with the public, widening participation um, to, to create a better understanding of our place in the natural world. And the National Saturday Club is a charitable organization making higher education um, accessible to youth across the nation. Um, so in wrapping up, I just wanna say, um, we hope that you've enjoyed Science Saturdays. We hope we've demonstrated to you that science is very broad um, and that you can shape your own research pathway. It's full of adventure and creativity and you don't have to have a traditional route through um, A-levels, undergrad, postgrad. There are many routes through and lots of people come to science later in life through very um, diverse backgrounds. So if you're interested in studying science, check out our Birkbeck um, School of Science web, web pages for more information. I want to thank all of our speakers from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, the Department of Biology, and the Department of Psychological Sciences from Birkbeck University of London. Um, this has been our final installment of Science Saturday. We hope we'll be back next year and you'll be here to join us. Thanks to everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.